So, uh, Josh, there's always a breakdown when economics comes up between the free market and socialism. And this is a topic that I know you've been passionate about so uh, for so long. So uh, what made you want to talk about this uh, specific talk- topic? Yeah, so um, you're right. This is something since my early college days I have passionately fought for as as. You know, anytime I hear the debates, left or right, it makes my blood boil. Um, mm-hmm. How it's handled uh, by politicians, media, everyone, and so I figured, you know, what? Right now, we're heading into an election right. um, with Democratic primary starting. Focus is going to be on them more, and we're going to see that debate come up again. You know, I'm a free market capitalist. Oh, they're a socialist, and you know, um, using these terms and having these arguments that you know, totally bogus and misleading to the American people. So, uh, yeah, let's uh, dig in and uh, see what we come up with. You're listening to It Might Be Interesting with your hosts, Josh Levy and John Walsh. Now, there's an endless amount of information out there on any given topic. And sometimes you just need somebody who can extrapolate it in a way that might be interesting. Okay, so you had mentioned that uh, you know people have a misunderstanding or a misconception about free market versus socialism. So uh, for the purpose of this episode, why don't we kind of uh, start out by uh, defining both. Uh, define for me the, the differences between uh, free market uh, capitalism versus socialism. Is the free market the same as capitalism? Like, let's, uh, let's just kind of break it down and, and give us your uh, overview of, of the differences between the two. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, basically, free market economics, a free market capitalist position as, as it's framed, uh, which are predicated on the set of beliefs that the economy and society as a whole will yield the greatest results and is better off overall with extremely limited intervention, uh, typically in the form of like government intervention. So um, it, the free market believes that um, people make rational choices. This is something that um, Milton Friedman spoke about is the consumer is the rational actor in the market. And so if you, um, let's say, for instance, you have an internet provider and they just ratchet up the costs like hell, um, you know, you're not an idiot. You're going to go to a competitor. Sure. You're going to change. We'll get into some of the issues there um, that are not taken into account later on. But um, that's essentially the the viewpoint of how they view the individual and that's what causes or leads to the uh, idea that, you know, it's about the consumer having their freedom. Um, and so th- that's also a bit of a misconception, but that's that's where that idea of like freedom comes into play. And um, it also operates under the presupposition that markets self-regulate. So for example, for, let's, for their own benefit, right? Yeah. And, and so for instance, and, and the benefit of, you know, the whole, the group. Um, so let's say for instance, the shampoo you use, um, you find out that there's a tremendously harsh chemical in it. That's terribly unhealthy for you. Well, of, of course, once again, you're not an idiot. You're not irrational. You would find a different shampoo as would pretty much everyone using that. And that company as a means of like market regulating itself, they would be forced if they wanted to stay in business and keep the lights on, they have to, you know, create that shampoo without that product, that chemical in it, they would have to change or die. And so that's the idea um, behind there. And there are a few key elements that even once again, Milton Friedman, you know, argued, believed, and um, these are, this has to do with information. So when you believe someone is a rational actor, you believe that they have the information they need. So for instance, you know what that chemical is and that it is harmful um, as well as that other people do. And they understand they understand it enough to where uh, you know they, they can make that decision. 
and it's not money, you know, and so. So um, let me ask you, I, I hear the, the phrase, the invisible hand a lot yep, in free yep. market uh, theory. What is the invisible hand? Can you define that for us? The invisible hand, um, Adam Smith is uh, kind of the original one who planted the seed for, for the idea of the invisible hand, uh, which led to free market economic theory. And the invisible hand is basically the argument that if government stops getting involved mm -hmm. uh, almost you know, entirely, we're talking almost absolutely entirely, like no regulations at all, that will yield the best and the healthiest results because the invisible hand is the market forces and w the consumer. Like the invisible hand essentially is the decisions made by consumers as a whole. Mm -hmm. It's the decision of you and everyone else using that shampoo to change. Gotcha. That is, that is what the invisible hand is. You are not deliberately trying to harm that company or push your hand on the scale. You're acting in your own best interests. Uh, understandably so, and that's what controls uh, the that's what controls the scale. Uh, and the invisible hand theory is that, uh, or belief is that, you know, the moment anyone else is in there, they have their hand on the scale. So the invisible hand consumers have less freedom to influence the market and and less freedom to act as, you know, the rational player in the market and have those choices um, associated with, um, with capitalism. And I'd say the final thing that is absolutely critical for this to succeed, any type of, you know, capitalism, free market or any form of it is healthy competition. When I say healthy, I mean, you know, several choices. Right. Not a monopoly and not even an oligopoly. Like, you should have several different cable companies, a few different, sat, you know, dish companies. If that were the case, we would have a very different internet situation. Prices would be a hell of a lot lower. Quality mm -hmm. would be higher because the company would need to offer better service and support. Otherwise, you would leave. But if you have one choice... There are a whole smorgasbord of of consequences that roll down onto the consumer, and and so that's the other thing is with with anything you know um, in especially modern Western cultures and economics, without healthy competition, everything starts to fall apart and have terrible ripple effects. So can you discuss the notion or the benefit uh, that the people or the individuals will have more freedom in a free market? It, that's something I hear conflated a lot, that if you have freedom of choice, and you see it in advertisement too, you know, uh, you're, you're free to choose this type of potato chip right. or whatever it is. You know, it's always used as a, as a hallmark of personal or individual liberty. Is it? Well, I'm glad you asked because... This is something, and this gets under my skin, is it is a what I call a surface level argument that just appeals to, you know, the the emotion, the the, you know, the heart of what drives, you know, uh, American tradition, the American dream and everything and our competitive drive, uh, the idea, you know, you have more freedom because the government is less involved. Um, however, the freedom just shifts when you think about it. So let me let me put it this way, especially for anyone listening who who does feel like the free market is freedom for consumers. Let's say, John, that I own a cell phone company mm -hmm. and it is totally deregulated and now the invisible hand is in place and you know everything's great. And then you sign up. And then a month in, you open your bill and you're like, what the hell? Like $150 in fees? They didn't tell me this. Mm. They didn't disclose this. Well, by, you know, traditional classical economics in a free market, you have the ability to change, right? So you come into the store and you say, I'm done, I'm canceling. Oh, well, sure, John, you know, you're more than welcome to just pay this uh, $500 cancellation fee. But by the way, that price was 
determined by the market, not by us. Right, um, right, right. Right, you know, like consumers were okay with spending that. They're the ones who dictated. You told us that we should charge you 500 bucks to cancel. But keep in mind, over 75% of Americans do not have the ability um, in, in liquid cash like they do in many cases on like credit card or whatever, but they don't have the ability to pay a $500 emergency or anything like that. So you are now stuck or it is at least a hell of a lot harder for you to act as that rational person who can choose. Like your, your options are now limited because even if you did pay to cancel and everything, well, you know, you don't really have the money to go immediately sign up for a competitor. It really kind of boxes you in and corners you. So when you think about free market, the point I want to make or the question I want to ask is, well, who has more freedom when you deregulate it? The business or the consumer? Like, think about it if you're listening. You know, if you... If you suddenly were hit with a bunch of fees that you didn't expect because it was deregulated or, you know, and this happened leading up to 2008, found out that the company you signed up, you know, uh, set up your mortgage through actually doesn't even own your mortgage and they've sold it and divvied it up and done all these ridiculously, you know, um, convoluted, confusing and unethical things with your mortgage right. uh, without you knowing, um, you know. Do you, do you feel like when you are standing in the store and I'm telling you, you got to pay the $500 plus the extra, you know, your bill and the 150 and hidden fees, do you feel like you suddenly have more freedom? Yeah, see, that's, that's what, I mean, you brought up that point and I thought that was great because who celebrates the deregulation? Is it the consumer or the business? Right. Who's the one lobbying Congress for the deregulation? Is yeah. it the business or the consumer? Well, yeah, exactly. And the problem is, you know, you can move, but you're still on the hook. Yeah. You know, you're, you know, you could be like, fine, screw this. I'm just signing up for a competitor and you can walk out. But, well, sorry, John, you're getting sent to collections like, we're going to get our money. We have every legal arm and mechanism to have our way mm -hmm. and be almost guaranteed that we will have our end um, seen to, but not yours. So, for instance, and, you know, and there's nothing inherently wrong with that. Like if you sign up with a service, you are engaging in a mutual understanding and contract. So right. you're saying, you know, I will pay you this. And if I pay you this and I, there's no messing around, no late you know, payments or any missed payments, then I, in return, will provide you the service you're paying for. Mm -hmm. And so the thing is, you know, I am receiving, I am almost guaranteed when you deregulate it, I, am, I can set things up so I'm almost guaranteed that I will receive what is technically owed to me by our agreement. Um, but if you walk out, you know, I can just shut off your service or do whatever, you know, so you have less power, less freedom, and the freedom just shifts. And it also completely mischaracterizes a lot of regulations. So in terms of freedom, for instance, any free market capitalist would will say they will, you know, fight to the death for you know, a competitive market, which is good. I believe in competitive markets a thousand percent. Um, the problem is when you completely deregulate it. So you're familiar with the Federal Trade Commission. Right. Their purpose, their, their primary purpose, they are predominantly in place to prevent monopolies from occurring. Hmm. So, you know, dating back to like Rockefeller and, and the oil when he literally had a monopoly on oil and the government said, look, this ain't good. You're, you're doing some unethical things with both pricing for consumers. You're doing terrible things to any you know, potential competitor. You have a monopoly. This is not okay. And they broke it up. Yeah. And they broke it up into several different companies. Uh, and they still, the kicker is they still let him be the 
top dog head of all the companies, but they did all each have their independent boards. They were kind of independently run. Um, but because of the competition, he actually went from being the richest man in history to having three times as much money as he had before. Um, wow. So, you know, the he fought it like hell because he thought he'd lose money um, when they forced, you know, uh, Standard Oil to to break up, but that wasn't the case. So anyway, uh, a regulation isn't necessarily, like it can, let's not, you know, let's make no bones about it. Like it can have a negative consequence. Um, it, it can hinder business. It can put some restrictions on them, but it also can guarantee the conditions required for a free market to occur. That seems to be the four-letter four-letter word for uh, a free market capitalist, socialism. Uh, would you mind defining socialism and, and how it differs? And uh, I, uh, I personally have found there's a lot of misconceptions surrounding mm -hmm. socialism. So maybe you can kind of free up some of that uh, uh, thinking as well. Yeah. So uh, basically, socialism is predicated on the uh, beliefs the you know derived from uh, behavioral economics. And at behavioral economics as a theory and everything and the details did come later on after, you know, socialism was created as a set of beliefs. But uh, socialism does uh, – is validated a lot in some ways by behavioral economics. And um, socialism says that um, society as a whole and the market yields the greatest results and is better off overall – when there are set rules and boundaries in which every you know entity or player in the market must adhere to so for instance every business you want to you want to start a business fine we're not going to stop you but if you hire someone you got to pay them this minimum wage at least hmm. that is that technically you could say you know <laughs> that is technically more of a socialist argument. You know, it is, uh, I view it as more of a, a regulated viewpoint. You know, yeah. we have, we have open market, like free market, like I mentioned, um, you know, free market, you, you actually are just trading off freedom and, uh, you're also trading off the burden. Like for instance, I think one thing we do need to assess in terms of, you know, whether regulation is valid or not is, evaluate the consequences between the business and consumer. Hmm. So if I was suddenly forced to rewrite documents and paperwork and, you know, retrain some employees on what they need to say to a new person so they know, so you know what fees are potentially coming your way and disclose that information, that, that is a little bit of a pain, you know, as a business. But the consequences for you, the consumer for being in that position, it affects your life so much more significantly, especially if you don't have a lot of money and can't pay that cancellation fee. It, it affects you so much more than the business. That's why in that situation, I do typically say, you know, we need to regulate and and have that. Um, so, but the, you know, the, the feeling that I always hear is that, you know, any regulation is socialism, you know, and... Right. Uh, I, I take it that the social side of it does not see the invisible hand as a uh, as an inevitability, and that they don't really see the um, the idea of self regulation as being uh, a you know a, a viable uh, option. I mean, do do, do markets self regulate? Are socialists wrong that they don't self regulate? Or or what's your view on that? You know, in some ways. Let's be real. Like, th there is this argument that also drives me nuts. You know, markets self-regulate. No, they don't. Hmm. This black and white. It's like, no, no, no. They can, in some cases, but at what cost? Right. So, for instance, let's say that shampoo chemical uh, was actually fatal if it got in your eyes. How many people need to die before people finally learn? Um, and and it also once again the. You know, self-regulation does depend on 
consumers being A, rational, and B, having all the information. When we finally learned, for, without a shred of doubt, the science was in, the facts were in, smoking a cigarette was harmful. Hmm. It took you know, a, a few decades before the majority of people adopted that because of how much misinformation, all the posters and ads showing doctors smoking cigarettes. Lead like, is another good example. Yeah, lead is a good example. And here's another example that I do like to point out is um, oftentimes you do, it is almost an absolute necessity to have a regulation um, imposed and intervened by government. And a great example is seat belts. Hmm. So for, for a long time, many years, uh, we had, or airbags is a better example. Airbag technology was in existence. Uh, pretty much every car company had the technology for airbags, but they, because of the cost at the time, they could afford it, but because of the cost, they only really made it a premium feature. Hmm. And the importance there, the reason I use that as an example is there were consumers who were like, we want the option to go with the car with airbags. But if every car with airbags is the premium model that we can't afford, basically everyone you know who wasn't upper middle class or wealthier had to get a car that didn't have airbags. They... There was no real interest uh, in budging in the industry because of the cost of having to adhere to the regulation, you know, the installation of airbags as well as testing them and making sure um, that they actually work. And the problem is they knew that several thousand additional people every single year were dying of accident from accidents they, that they could have and should have been able to just walk away from. Hmm. They knew this. Um, Ralph Nader was the one who, you know, was the, uh, one who Consumer first, advocate. yeah, he was, he was the first one to go to Congress and lobby the hell out of it saying, you know, how many more of his college friends, he had graduated, gone to a law firm and he said, how many more, um, of my friends are going to, uh, am I going to get invitations to their funeral because they were in an accident they could have walked away from, but the automakers didn't put airbags in and you know the the other thing to point out is this was known and furthermore the automakers went after him with a vengeance to stop him yeah um so it wasn't like they didn't know or you know they weren't really uh it was an oversight or they weren't really acting out of malevolence or anything uh, no they they deliberately did everything they could to stop him uh he refused to back down, fought like hell. And because the market, that's the thing is with the invisible hand, the market demand to regulate and get the airbags in entry-level cars was there. Like th it should have regulated, but because of the conditions and the fact that you didn't have that many choices, you know, it was like Ford, Chevy, Dodge, you know, that was it. Um, you know, or like basically GM or Ford and where your two options, you didn't have a huge set of options. So, you know, the part of the invisible hand was there. Like imagine the invisible hand pressing its absolute hardest on the scale and not budging it an inch. Hmm. The consumers wanted it. And that's why the government sometimes does need to come in because they are stronger than an invisible hand at times, but I do agree with and respect the uh, argument, you know, they can maybe go push down a little too hard, the government, and the more they do, the more it can stifle business growth because it now it costs a lot more if you want to start a car company because you have to add all these safety features you're required to, which costs a lot of money, so uh, there is that trade-off. However, if someone started a new car company like Tesla, um, I, I would hope they had airbags. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, 
you know, a lot of times I, I, I hear a slippery slope argument right. for the, the free market thing. Uh, or, you know, people that are on the free market side, they see uh, any sort of government intervention uh, immediately labeled as socialism. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they act as though it's Leninism or Marxism, right. you know, which is just all out communism. Uh, and even communist dictatorship, you know, mm -hmm. Stalinism or whatever. So what's the difference between socialism and communism? Where does that barometer get set between the two? Uh, and, you know, just kind of define it for us so that we can see that, the, you know, that accusation is a bit, well, in my view, hyperbolic. Yeah, and, you know, I heard um, I have a good friend from college who's, I mean, hyper-libertarian. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I say hyper-libertarian, we once had to – we had these debates where we trade off selecting topics, and once he chose the topic of no more driver's licenses. Like, we shouldn't be required – like, a 12-year-old could get in a car and drive. I mean, he wanted to abolish driver's licenses, and like, that's how libertarian he was. And so um, he also believed, like, yes, there's this, this slippery slope, and um, because, like he said, uh, we – we act like socialism and communism are not siblings, he said, but they are kissing cousins. And I laughed when I heard that. I was like, okay, you know, that's – they are in some ways a little closer than some people like to admit. But the problem with it is drawing that line between when socialism becomes like Marxism isn't that easy. You right. know, when you think about it. So here's a good analogy I use is free market uh, – and by free market, total free market capitalism in its purest form um, is imagine the Super Bowl happens um, next Sunday and both teams take the field. But, you know, both teams can choose how many players are on the field, um, what pads they wear, what – type of plays they you know they th there's not a single the refs don't even have a flag they can throw there are no penalties nothing yeah, that's, that's kind of like what's to stop them from having basketball players on the field at that yeah, point I, I mean but not just that what's to stop them from cheating or doing things that are actually harmful like in the business you know bringing well, firearms yeah I, I mean I, I know that does also seem hyperbolic but remember when there was a time where it was hugely problematic when industrial uh, companies were just dumping waste into rivers because it was much more cost effective than you know having it hauled away to for proper disposal and it was widespread you know and and that's the thing is like what what's going to stop remember deflate gate with uh the patriots right, where, uh, yeah. you know what what's going to stop someone from cheating and what i tell people is keep in mind 99.9% .9 of the time let me ask you who's the one who gets cheated are you the one cheating that cell phone company or are they cheating you right yeah. and um socialism is saying all right guys here are the rules. Um, you know, you do have to. Here's how the game is played. And and both teams need to adhere to the exact same rules. They don't have their different rules. Um, and to me, the difference between socialism and communism or Marxism is um, a a determination of outcome. So socialism will play around with the boundaries and the rules. Um, and say, okay, you can't now. You can't hit in this certain way, which does change the game. Like, yeah. let's not let's make no bones about it. Like, it does change the game. However, like once again, both teams play by that rule, and the outcome is whatever the outcome is between the game. So Marxism would say, look, you know, the Cincinnati Bengals, they really suck. They would look at the, you know, you, you know how they do like a point differential. Like, hmm. you know, the Bengals have a 14-point disadvantage when they go up against the Patriots. Um, therefore, the Bengals will start with 14 points. That is Marxism. Hmm. And Marxism is affecting the outcome of, you know, a, a market uh, action or transaction or... Um, is it a perception for fairness? 
Yeah, I, I mean that's that's the problem. Is that's why um, so many people easily and they completely misunderstand. There there are people I've met who wear Marxist T-shirts, th- claiming to be communist Marxist, but the moment you talk to them and ask them any questions, they they aren't. They just don't understand because socialist I- socialism is based on uh, an idea of fairness. Meaning, you know, okay, yeah, we, I know it's probably more uncomfortable and you have less mobility and it's probably hotter in the beginning of the season when you got all those pads on. Yeah. But your safety is important enough to wear. Sorry, you got to have it. You got to wear those pads. And so, you know, for a socialist um, policy, it's like, look, we want you to succeed. We want you to climb the ladder. We don't want as a business owner, we don't want you to not make money, but the problem is no matter what the system is, there is always going to be a percentage of people and a significant enough percentage who are very much at the bottom of like below the bottom of the ladder in absolute poverty and we need to have a safety net for them. So and, I've I've always seen that communism is a, a, a means of – uh, or rather, a control of the means of production. It's kind of the end result mm. they're looking for. And I've always seen the free market, uh, like without any government intervention whatsoever, as being a fiction uh, mm-hmm. in the same way communism is. Because if you take government out of the market, you don't have a free market. You have a black market. And mm-hmm. the way I've always seen it is within a black market, the only rule is the golden rule, which is he with the most gold makes all the rules. Right. Right. So the idea that if we just get rid of government uh, out of the marketplace, that everyone's going to be fair and have an agreed upon. Uh, anyone that I that I have talked to that believes that, I think has a, a very, um, I don't know, romantic view of what business is there for when it's really just about amassing a, as much capital as possible. But it, not only that, they are not these diametrically opposed forces. That That's kind of one of the main points I have and one of the problems with saying, oh, I'm a free market economist or I'm a socialist or, hey, John's a socialist, uh, you know, mm-hmm. now view him negatively is, uh, you know, the, a, again, a free market is a market where the people do have the ability to determine an outcome. And that outcome often is a rule because people will find out that lead in children's toys is not good and they, they're they sick and tired of checking every toy to make sure it doesn't have lead. So a politician will run for office saying, look, I'm going to pass a law that says no lead. And they go, well, thank you. And that is the free market acting in a but way. But it's also democracy. It's democracy and a free market acting in a way um, you know, where they say, okay, this is what I want. So that's why... I often argue that um, if if you did deregulate and get rid of stuff like that, it's only a matter of, it, it's only a matter of time before it would just come back because people would be like, no, I'm sick and tired of uh, of this happening, and it would the the regulation would eventually return. So um, you know the the idea of that free market, and you're right, like it is um, e- even economists who really conjured up free market, especially the economist who came up with uh, supply side trickle down economics Hmm. has come out. um, I believe it was in the late nineties. I'll have to check, but he basically said, look in theory, like it it wasn't like he was trying to do anything bad. Right. It, It is a good theory. Free market economics is a very sound theory, but in reality and practice, even the, Founder of the theory of trickle down economics said, in practice, it just doesn't work. There. Well, Alan Greenspan said something similar after the financial collapse. Mm-hmm. He, he had a you know kind of a come to Jesus moment where he was just like you know we were wrong. We just we were flatly wrong to to deregulate uh, you know uh, investment banks. Yeah, and I think a fair uh, criticism of both sides, like more free market, you know. Uh, conservative versus you know liberal left leaning is uh, 
I think both systems are strongly rooted in a belief that, you know, people know what's best for them and what's great versus no, they don't. And I think we might lean a little too hard on those. So like, you know, a free market capitalist believes that people are smarter than they are and these left-leaning socialists believe people are dumber than they are. Hmm. And um, that's why it's like, look, yes, uh, and w- again, the two aren't diametrically opposed. So for instance, um, you know, in order to make a, the right decision about what you should eat and what you should feed your family, you got to know what's in the damn food, right? right yeah. So as a result, we create a regulation saying you have to have this nutrition label. And the reason it's a regulation is because, A, it's required for every single company uh, that sells food, but also that it's a standard. That, you know, no matter what item you pick up, you know how to read, you you know what's on that label, you know what, um, you know, what things to look for. It's it's uniform. But here's the the problem. I think we discussed this in our uh, episode of The American Diet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there is one ingredient or, or one thing on that nutrition label. You'll notice they all have percent of daily consumption. You know, right. sodium twenty uh, percent of your daily. You know, one serving is twenty percent. Same with like zinc and vitamin C and blah blah blah. There's one ingredient that doesn't have that though. Right. Which one is that? Again? That would be sugar. Sugar. Yeah. And let me let me tell you. I, I think anyone in their right mind w- will agree that um, it wasn't the consumer free market that dictated that sugar does not have a percent daily value. There is even evidence, like full on, full blown evidence saying the lobbyists fought to ensure that food manufacturers and labelers cannot put that percentage on. Because then it'll show, holy cow, one serving is 2,500% right. of the sugar I should be consuming. And, you know, they would make arguments like, well, you know, if someone's diabetic, as if a diabetic person doesn't know what limitations they have and right. what, you know, so, um, and they'd say, oh, it's too different. Well, the same thing is with sodium and fat and everything else, you know, so um, to give a, um, you know, and it even has a disclaimer at the bottom, like, you know, this is general, you need to talk to your doctor, you know, the percentages can vary. So um, the reason I point that out is that is a deliberate effort and move and um, rule that is preventing consumers from having the information they need to make that decision. So as Milton Friedman would argue, like, no, you have the information – you can uh, make that decision. Well, what if, for you know reasons like lobbyists, that information is being withheld, or especially with the digital age, what if? I mean, look how much misinformation there is out there. The anti-vax belief yeah. has exploded with the explosion of the internet. Right, and so it is easy to misinform people. We. And there's, you know, the milk carton experiment at grocery store, which shows people will not buy the 99 cent carton of milk, even if it's identical to the one that's 379, because we have this ingrained perception, something's got to be wrong with that 99 cent milk. That doesn't mean you're rational. Like there's a very rational, you know, evolutionary reason why you probably don't want to risk serving your children spoiled milk. Right. Um, especially since it, that reason dates back to times where spoiled milk and you're dead. You know, you're not just sick for a day, you're dead. And so um, it isn't that people are acting irrationally. Um, in fact, look at this. Um, here's an example is if people acted rationally for the most part, gambling wouldn't even – Vegas would be – one or two little casinos and that's it. Right. Like yeah. nobody would gamble. V- very few people would do that, you know. Um, or, you know, you can argue, oh, that's a vice, which is different. Okay. Um, not a single person would spend a penny on psychics. Hmm. 
So uh, there are countless examples of why um, people aren't. But here's here's what's also important with if anyone is you know that classical economic minded person. I'm not saying you're full of it. Like the, there's a difference. It is not behavioral verse classical. Classical economics states how things should be. Like people should be informed. They should be making rational decisions. Companies should be doing the right thing. Um, and so if we were to, you know, plot and predict the economy based on that, you know, we would have a we would have very set markers of where we should be as a country. Hmm. Behavioral economics, like showing trends in an increase in gambling um, or even increase or decrease in divorces, you know, um, investing in the stock market, these show us where we actually are versus where we should be. If we didn't have the classical economic points on the chart, you'd look at the behavioral economics points and go, well, what, what the hell does that even mean? Hmm. Like, what's that for? Is that good or bad where it is? You know, and then, but as soon as you add the classical economic plot points, you can see, oh, wow, we're, we're actually really far, or no, we're actually pretty close to where we should be. Um, and so the farther you get from the classical economic predictions, the worse things are. And so um, that's why going with one is either, you know, one or the other is very naive. Thanks for listening to It Might Be Interesting. Please join us next time. And make sure you check out our website for other episodes, itmightbeinteresting.com. And we'd love to hear any thoughts, questions, feedback, and even episode suggestions you have. So if you do have any, please send it over to thoughts at itmightbeinteresting.com.